Do you put the spike on? Um, one, two. What's that? This one. That one. Let's start again. <clears throat> Good evening and welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Noel Daniels. I'm the CEO of Cornerstone. And it's truly an honor and privilege for me to be able to host this evening. Um, Cornerstone Institute um, is really excited about what it is that we wanting to do with our institution. As an institution of higher learning, we want this to be a vibrant place. We really want to break away from the concept of the university as an ivory tower. We really, really driven by tackling relevant, meaningful issues and concerns that affects our communities and enables us to continually grow and learn. And as an institution, we pride ourselves in our vision of making higher education accessible creating teaching and learning in an environment which is about service to others and pushing an agenda which says we need to advance social justice and human dignity for all. So if that's what our institution is about, if that's what you're interested in, then we want to talk with you. We want to be in the same space with you. We want to enable what it is that you are thriving alongside the vision that we've established for ourselves. We've got an amazing body of students. They've got such incredible stories to tell. I want to introduce you to one of our students. Her name is Jean. She hails from Zambia. She was accepted at the University of Zambia to study medicine. She decided after visiting Cornerstone by chance that this is where she wanted to be. And even though her parents protested about her wanting to study here, and they actually came to visit us here at Cornerstone. When they saw what happened here, they said, Jean, you go and study at Cornerstone. We're happy for you to pursue your study. So can I show you as a one-minute clip? We've got quite a few clips like this on our website, and I encourage you to get to know our students through um, seeing and reviewing these video clips that's on our website. So let me in uh, introduce you to Jean Nanguala. <laughs> I'm Jean Nangwala and I'm 21 years old, studying BA in psych, psychology, yeah. <laughs> How am I going to change the world? Um, I want to be in, just storytelling, like I need to tell the stories and I need to bring the stories to life so that people actually need to see that it's important to heal, it's important to face situations like it's good to be resilient, yes of course, but it's important to actually face them as well because it makes you a strong, a better person and talking about things or facing um, issues or dealing with them does not make you weak at all. Um, so being able to just show um, stories of survival and for people to actually learn that there's beauty in brokenness so you don't have to hide everything like how broken you are could help somebody else grow so that for me is like I really want to facilitate that um, and I'm very excited about it we really are we really are very grateful to have students like Jean at um, our university um, and as I said, she represents many other students who have uh, very interesting uh, stories to tell. At Cornerstone, our biggest program is psychology. Uh, we offer um, an honors, which is uh, credited by the Health Professionals Council. We also, in our second biggest program, which is education, we qualify teachers. We've just been awarded a PGCE, a postgraduate certificate in education at the foundation phase. So we're very excited about that because we've held the uh, PGC at the intermediate phase for a long time. 
Then uh, our third biggest program is theology, um, which is our providence, where we come from. Uh, we're very proud of the work that we do in theological spaces. In fact, on the 30th of September, I'd like to invite you to come to Nyanga East, where we're working with the community in Nyanga, pulling together not only theologians, but people across the board to talk about how we deal with the kind of challenges that people in that community face. Um, then, of course, we have uh, our sociology and community development. We're the only universities of Africa with an honors in community development. Um, and then um, we also have a business faculty where we have a BCom now also newly awarded with majors in marketing, entrepreneurship, industrial psychology, human resource management, and uh, economics. So I've given it to you in a nutshell, what happens at Cornerstone. How many of you are here for the very first time? Can I just get an indication? Great, great. So we are reaching more and more people, and we really, really don't want it to be your last time. Those of you who are regular, welcome, and thank you for coming back again. Those of you, of you who are here for the first time, please take some time to learn more about what happens here. Our um, stand is in the foyer. Leanne is waiting there to meet you and to share more information if you are interested to know in more detail what it is that we offer at Cornerstone. But let us get on with the, with the evening. We've got a beautiful surprise for you. Uh, Dr. Alan Busak uh, joined us on Thursday evening um, where we celebrated the 10th anniversary of the Cape Cultural Collective. And like the rest of the audience, he was completely blown away by the performance of the Ruasa Choir. Unfortunately, we couldn't at short notice bring the choir back together today, but we brought a cross-section of members of that choir uh, together to come and open up this evening for you. And I'd like to ask you to give the Ruasa Choir uh, a round of applause. They joined by Profound, who's um, quite an incredible poet, as you will hear. So people, I'm handing over to the Ruasa Choir. Evening, everybody. I'm Profound, the poet. They're the Rosa Choir. <laughs> Just get that out of the way quickly. Look 
Look across the island into the bay. We are all islands. So comes the day we cross the burning water. to swim, young black. The township is sinking, young black. There will be no calls for May Day. May Day rallies will rally no troops in your name, young black. Do you still even know your name, young black? Is your history still born in pain, young black? Will the pages of history ever contain a young black bold and beautiful story of the days of our lives for this generation's legacy. Unestingo, esistumo, umang kolega putuma, selma tunzi, little nga baleli langa, kumezi nyi dumbu. Eza nam sanji imbali, bunum sabu se mans, ilang al baleli, umlote mlote, noza wets bafele manya leni, ama chega echambe masimin, nanam sanjo mama basakindeze le makishin, o baba sebeyawa kokanyao. 
Abasele bapuka maqolo ipiki nefoshoro nemholo yemhlala phansa yikho fokhona. Zakwethu sezani ngale democracy. Sifuna umhlaba kodwa sihlulwa yikasi. We take from our own worse than the enemy stole from us. We're young, we're black, we're restless, we're street, we are township, a bed of thorns where dreams go to sleep. Each day is a nightmare sleep. Our ghetto is never woke, but it never sleeps. Ticking till the morning of sons and daughters. Our dreams held in the calloused hands of a broken clock and reaching for death non-stop. Tick, tick, tick. We talk the talk, but can we walk the walk? Yes, you. Do your bones no longer weep for the sin in the color of your skin? Or have you given in, young, black, gifted with ignorance? There's too many of us, half victim, half witness. Our legacies, caskets selected, the white tent erected, the reaper's black hearse, docks in reverse, reverb, the sound of John 14, the black verse, evil undertaking the black church, Ekasi buried under six. By six, by six, raised high the crucifix. We had funerals posing for Insta pics, blinded by the flash but missing the picture. We're young, we're black, we're on drugs, we're on liquor. The flame in our lungs can no longer flicker. We fell victim to freedom written on t shirts and stickers, tight pants and snickers, rims and some speakers. And then we built literally house pillars on Declack's foundation. Is this still your home, young black? Quit building things you don't own, young black. You've got no land to build a home, but upon death you've freely given. We're missing out the action in a chain of reactions and chain to oppression. I swear to God, death lives a lotion, witchcraft, extortion, childhood abortion. Each and every day there's a child that goes missing. We're young, we're black, we're missing. Six by six. By six, see the crucifix could not fix the hood. Eyes on the sparrow have never seen the ghetto. The bun in the oven is born in a hellhole and is black from the get go, cut by the ghetto. Young, black, grieving before teething, teeth still missing, seeking direction and concentration, plantation street corners. Each weekend, mothers torn as they mourn us. Our fathers don't know us, they buried as paupers. So, dear white Jesus. Please forgive our daily slaughters. See, the blood of the lamb never bled for us. Our daily bread has made us nameless. Maim the death that trespasses against us. Dear God, deliver us from us. Build us a hood in the heavens. In the good book, we need a mention. i page the pages of history, and on paper, we're known as the young, black, without papers. Young, black, illiterate. Young, black, addicted. Young, black, infected. Young, black, convicted. The ghetto needs a hero, man. I want death to stop wearing our flesh as a cape. I've mourned too many of my superheroes in the ghettos of Jersey, Durban, and Cape. And even when I pick up a pen to escape, I still spell conflict in my rhyme schemes. I clench my fingers with every punchline. I want to fix my wrists in the shape of a crucifix and hang the sin in the color of my skin for good. I want to save the hood. Let's save the hood, young black. Let's save the hood. Make space to grow food. Stay out the smokles. Be more in schools, young black. Let's stop coming to our doom like roaches in the name of being cool, young black. Let's save the hood, young black. The ghetto needs a hero. So, young black. This poem is not the future. This poem is not the past. This poem is now. The time is now, young black.
big thank you to the Lewis Choir, Profound, and the Cape Cultural Collective. Um, what a fitting start to the evening. Um, I appeal to you to support the work of the Cape Cultural Collective. Uh, please go onto the website. There are regular events where the Cape Cultural Collective feature um, in our city all over the place. So you can see them next year at Cornerstone on Sunday, the 1st of October. Uh, we are part of the Open Streets Initiative. Uh, it runs right past our place. It, um, the streets open to people and close to cars from the Science Center right through to the Grand Parade. So uh, Cornerstone is an activity hub. We will have a whole lot of fun activities here um, where we, we will also um, provide some enlightenment as well. So um, it will be fun, but um, with a purpose as well. The next part um, uh, of what I have to do um, really, really makes me uh, very, very proud to introduce to you to um, a person of the caliber of Desiree Paulson. So I'm very pleased to say that Desiree is going to be facilitating the rest of the evening, um, and I will uh, take a back seat, and uh, Desiree will come up um, to introduce uh, our speaker. But I just want to read something to you, um, which is Desiree's word, which talks more to uh, the fact that she's a, a facilitator par excellence. Um, and I think in her words, um, it helps us to understand the kind of person that we've selected to facilitate this evening's discussion for us. So Desiree said that I believe that a new depth of connectivity is needed for humanity to move forward. I facilitate spaces for people and organizations to express themselves freely with more authenticity. In these spaces, I create an enabling environment for people to find inspiration and direction to make a significant contribution to the world. When energizing, stimulating, safe spaces are created and people are appreciated and valued for their efforts and given the opportunity to express their wisdom, harness their potential and share their perspectives in honest ways, then their engagement and work improves significantly. My goal is to facilitate processes that take individuals and organizations to new and different depths and levels of courageous engagement that unleashes creativity and honest engagement in contributing to transformation of people and organizations. My aim is to provide opportunities for people and organizations to see themselves differently so that they can connect in ways that allow them to work together and embrace their diversity and with a deeper understanding and respect for what each other can contribute. I also believe that once people and organizations are connected to their passion and purpose and are able to discover their meaningful contribution, connection to the team and larger organizational system and the world at large, then they are able to move forward in new and exciting ways. Now, those words are dead words, words, and if Someone can speak like that and speak to one's heart, one's mind, and one's soul in the way that Desiree Paulson can. Then I'm very, very pleased to introduce you to a round of applause for Desiree Paulson. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Tonight's not about me. I'm just here to facilitate. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alan Visser, who needs no introduction, but um, I thought that I should uh, give some background for those of you who were still in nappies in the 80s. So how many of you attended the UDF rallies in the 80s? We shouted, Busta, Busta. Remember those rallies at UWC? So um, the, the introduction is for those of you who weren't there. So Dr. Busak, South African theologian and human rights activist, is the first holder of the Desmond Tutu Chair for Peace, Justice and Reconciliation Studies at Christian Theological Seminary and Butler University, Indianapolis in the States. He is the Dean's Research Associate at the Theological F Faculty, Pretoria University. His previous books include Dare We Speak of Hope, 2014, 
Busak first became known as a liberation theologian with the publication of his doctoral dissertation, Farewell to Innocence. He was an influential activist against apartheid in the 1980s in South Africa, where he worked closely with Archbishop Tutu and Nelson Mandela. He has served South African churches and the worldwide ecumenical movement in various senior capacities since 1978, including as president of the World Alliance of Reformed Churches. He was the first African and the youngest person ever elected to that position. How old were you then? <laughs> Not going to give your age away. <laughs> he, he has received numerous awards including the Robert Kennedy Human Rights Award and the Martin Luther King Jr. Peace Award. This lecture comes at a time when we are in dire need of inspiration and direction as a nation. The title of the lecture is quite interesting. It says, Will Zacchaeus Remain Sitting in the Tree? Reconciliation as Justice or as a Form of Capture? Dr. Alan Busak was recently quoted as saying that there cannot be reconciliation without justice. Drawing from his newly published book, which is on sale at the back, and there'll be uh, an opportunity for book signing later. The title of the book is also very interesting. You'll probably hear all about it. Pharaohs on both sides of the blood, red waters. Prophetic critique on empire, resistance, justice, and power of the hopeful seas wing. Dr. Alan Busak explains that for reconciliation to be the justice bringing restorative power it is meant to be, and for hope to be the transformational, life-affirming power it is intended to be, neither angels nor demons are necessary. He continues by saying, what our world needs are ordinary human beings, but I speak of a humanized, redeemed, and redemptive ordinariness, committed, steadfast, courageous, hopeful, and single-minded towards justice, together in all our rich diversity. He urges us to embrace audacious hope, without which no struggle has a future. So this open public lecture poses the question, what? Given the substantial socio-political challenges our democracy faces today, should the ordinary South African do to advance reconciliation and nation building? It gives me great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Alan Busak. Thank you so much, Ms. Paulson. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is wonderful to see you all here tonight, and I'm deeply grateful to Cornerstone uh, for this invitation and this event. Uh, when I heard on Thursday last the uh, choir, uh, just three of whom uh, sang for us tonight, I thought on Friday morning, I should try and get them here. Um, I cannot tell you what I felt when I heard that poem. Profound, my brother, you have a great and wonderful gift. And I'm glad and happy that you're using it in the way that you are. I hope that this message will be spread far and wide. And I told um, Mansur Jaffer, who's an old friend and activist and leader in this group, who went to all sorts of trouble to get the group together at my urging over uh, the weekend, um, I told him that I will continue to sing the praises of this choir and, and the cultural collective wherever I go and expose you more and more to us. So thank you, wonderful work that you are doing. I really do appreciate your coming here tonight. Ek is maar vandaai dominees wat, as jy weet die preek is nie so goed, jy kree jou goeie koor. Ek 
So tonight, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll speak on will Zacchaeus remain sitting in the tree, reconciliation as justice or as a form of capture. Now I need to say three things up front. First of all, for those of you who had forgotten your Bible, and for those who read the Bible but had forgotten about Zacchaeus, and those who read the Bible and skip Zacchaeus, <laughs> the story is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, uh, verses 1 to 10. Second, some things I will be saying tonight and some I have committed to paper in the book that uh, I hope you will buy tonight are things that I have been saying for some time now, both during our struggle and after 1994. Mostly, it seemed to me, South Africans then were not so ready to hear these things. Some got anxious and some got quite angry when I did say them, I'm hoping that we are now more open to such conversations. Third, reconciliation as a form of capture is not my idea. It's that uh, of the formidable Rudy Oosterweg connected to this institution, uh, the person who invited me to speak initially after reading the book. So I'm mentioning this so that you can see if you read the book, all sorts of brilliant ideas pop up in your mind. And at first, though, I thought it was a rather odd idea, especially seeing the swirling and confused and obsessive, but mostly unhelpful debates about the latest form of state capture we are now experiencing in South Africa, and that debate is now consuming so much of our time. But then I thought about it again. And I thought about the meeting early in the 1990s when I was still in the leadership of the African National Congress. And we had a meeting and we were talking about the formation of a truth commission. The meeting was interrupted because Mr. Mandela was called away for a telephone call. He came back. And he said that the telephone call was from Mr. De Klerk. And Mr. De Klerk had a proposal that we talk not simply of a truth commission, but of a truth and reconciliation commission, which the ANC subsequently accepted. I thought then, and I think about it more and more now, that Mr. De Klerk had known better our people's spiritual inclinations than the ANC did, because he understood better than the ANC that if you speak only about truth, all sorts of things might happen that you don't want. If you, however, raise the question of reconciliation, then our people, faithful people that we are, and people of faith that we are, think Bible, we think God, we think gospel, we think Jesus, and as soon as you think Jesus, you think forgiveness, and then it doesn't matter how ugly the truth is that comes out because I've got to forgive, right? And the clerk was not as silly and simple as some people made him out to be. But I also thought of an evening in 2002 uh, when I went to Johannesburg for a meeting and at the door, I was stopped by five young people from Soweto. And they waited for me. And they asked me the question, Doc, what do you think of this reconciliation business? So I said, I think it's a wonderful thing. I think it's great for our country. I think we should be doing this. And they were looking at me, and I could see the skepticism growing on their faces. And they said, well, we don't think so, because here we are. Uh, we are still in Soweto, nothing has changed for us, you heard profound tonight, and they said more or less the same thing to me. And then I thought, let me pull the magic word on them. And the magic word for a long time was, of course, Madiba. 
And I said, but what about Mr. Mandela? Isn't he giving us a wonderful example of reconciliation and forgiveness? And this young man turned to me and he said, well, if they make me president and they give me a million dollars, I will forgive everybody in sight. <laughs> Profound insight even then. And then I also thought about what we all should know by now, ladies and gentlemen, how much our reconciliation process had been predetermined by the secret pre-negotiation negotiation talks that had been going on in secret since 1985. And there are books about this by St. Peter Blanche and Richard Callan and Patrick Bond who are all very critical of it. And then there is a book from Alastair Sparks who welcomed these secret talks. And then of course there are books of Professor Willi Estresen and lately uh, Neil Barnard uh, of National Intelligence Agency fame um, who write with pride about it and of their role in it. So after all, it was not such a far-fetched idea. Our reconciliation captured, and we in turn being captured by that captured form of reconciliation that has captured our private and public life since 1994. But the capture of our reconciliation process, what does that mean? As a preliminary answer, one might say it means the capture of our politics after the negotiated settlement, the capture of our thinking and consequently of our public discourse, the capture of our memories of our horrific past and of our struggles against it and the real significance of those struggles, the capture of our ideas and our expectations of and our ideals for our democracy, the capture of our conception of ourselves as the unique, quite exceptional rainbow nation without finding it necessary to consider what it might mean for us that in the Bible, the rainbow appears as a promise of new life only after the flood that came because the world that God created and the humans God thought God had created in God's image had been captured by evil. In the Bible described as violent so much so that God aggrieved to God's heart, regretted having created them as Genesis 6 verse 6 tells us. In other words, the rainbow as a promise and a covenant, and both words have been used by Mr. Mandela in our reconciliation discussions, came after God had actually had the courage to face what the Bible seems to point out as a cosmic mistake with quite catastrophic proportions. We have been captured by a dominant narrative that we are a reconciled society with an already deracialized economy by the belief that the past is not to be honestly confronted because it would make the rainbow nation impossible. Captured by the argument that to insist on reconciliation as the restoration of justice, restitution, and dignity is to pathologize the nation, to quote the late Jake Scherville, by the political and theological illusion that reconciliation, although costly, in fact priceless, could be gotten cheap and easy and in the blink of an eye. Finally, perhaps, and for Christians especially, we are talking about the capture of the gospel of Jesus Christ by what I have called political pietism and Christian quietism. These are disturbing thoughts, and I do not claim the ability to answer all of these questions that come with them tonight. But tonight is an excellent beginning for such a conversation for which once again, we must thank Cornerstone and the leadership of this fine 
institution and which I hope we will continue here and elsewhere. Now, I don't know what our politicians thought they were doing, although we now know more than we knew back in 94. But in response to our calling to reconciliation, the church in South Africa has sought to do what I think is the impossible. Namely, we talk about reconciliation and we want to walk with Jesus while all the time leaving Zacchaeus sitting in that tree. And I hope it will become clear as we go on tonight why I make this statement and why it is so important to have a new, more honest, more courageous conversation about reconciliation. And to have it not only with Jesus but with Zacchaeus under that sycamore tree. Up front, especially for Christians, should be the question whether it is at all appropriate to even speak of reconciliation. Princeton University theologian Willie Jennings even suggests that we should avoid the word reconciliation altogether. Scrap it, he says, from your Christian lexicon. He says, we should not even talk about it. And I understand why. Have we been able to make that crucial distinction between reconciliation as a political necessity, reconciliation as sentimental appeasement, and reconciliation as a biblical imperative? Have we been willing to rise above the minimalist requirements for political reconciliation urged upon us by our politicians and subject ourselves to the radical demands of biblical reconciliation? Have we been able to honestly deal with the truth that for Christians, reconciliation is not an option among other options, where we weigh the risks, consider the probabilities for success or failure, and then with cautious optimism feel free to choose the path more feasible, more manageable. And if reconciliation is not an option, it is an obligation, it is a calling, it is a ministry entrusted to us by God. How have we fulfilled this obligation is the question. South Africa's reconciliation process has also been held up as a model for others to emulate. Not just for persons of faith, but for our people as a whole and for our politics. Not just for us, but for the world. Reconciliation has been called our national project and it is embedded together with Ubuntu as a bedrock of our constitution, one of the most progressive in the world. Our colonialist, imperialist past and the legacies of racism, slavery, genocide and dispossession and later the dehumanization and destruction of apartheid have placed us as a country and a people before life-altering decisions and choices. And South Africans tell ourselves we have made all the right decisions. On December 16, we celebrate a public holiday called the Day of Reconciliation. It replaced an earlier holiday, actually a holy day, a civil religious, sacrilegious, nationalistic fest from apartheid's history called the Day of the Vow. It was the day on which white apartheid South Africa, but more specifically the Afrikaans-speaking white Christians, celebrated the military victory over the Zulu nation, a gift from their powerful God, together with the right to claim the land as their own. And after the victory over apartheid, and the dawning of democracy, the day became Reconciliation Day, celebrating instead the decision that oppressed South Africans would seek reconciliation rather than retribution, forgiveness rather than revenge, when we had to decide on how to respond to those 350 years of slavery and dehumanization and genocide and dispossession and to the consequences of the crime against humanity called apartheid. 
So reconciliation claims space in the nation's memory and in the nation's daily life. But reconciliation itself should become a sacred space, but only if it becomes a place of remorse and repentance, of forgiveness and the restoration of justice and hope. However, today, almost 20 years after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and after the euphoria of a freedom fought for but not yet gained, after forgiveness offered but justice denied, after sacrifices made in hope on top of sacrifices made in struggle, our reconciliation process is under savage strain. We have been put on notice to speak of reconciliation less triumphantly, but more thoughtfully, with less certitude, but with more conviction, with more humility, but even more conscious of the presence of God and of the blood soaked into the soil. When we dare speak of reconciliation now, we cannot do so without first having taken the shoes off our feet, for it is holy ground. And so we should be clear. Reconciliation is not a triumphant end cry ending with an exclamation mark. It is a question waiting for an answer. In a sense, of course, the answer has already been given, biblically speaking, by God. In God's reconciling work through Jesus Christ. And politically speaking, by the struggle and the sacrifices and the rightful demands of our people. But our politics and the church have not yet truly responded. And where we have, we have not responded very well. We have not been willing or ready to understand that reconciliation, whether we speak of it politically or not if, it is not, if it is to be meaningful and durable and sustainable, should also be real, radical, and revolutionary. This is what I mean. It is real because it is not a cover for political pietism and Christian quietism. It is radical because it is about much more than just harmonious personal relationships. It is about the restoration of justice and rights and human dignity, and not about the protection and the preservation of wealth and power of the already privileged. It is never shallow, but it goes to the root of things. It is revolutionary because it seeks the transformation of persons and societies, their systems and their structures, their politics and the intentions and the workings of their policies. It seeks the transformation of the world. And biblically speaking, it is the ministry through which God is reconciling the world unto God's self. And politically speaking, it is the most common sense strategy toward more justice, more equity, and our desperate need for social cohesion. And therefore, it is costly. It is never cheap. In a sense, because we have heard the Apostle Paul speak in 2 Corinthians 5, Christians also know that reconciliation is, as I have tried to say before, not an option. As if we can weigh other options and consider the risks take into account the political possibilities and the economic consequences and make decisions on minimalist versus maximalist approaches, hedging against the shocking demands of the gospel with calculated preemptive incrementalism, all under the guise of what is called politics as the art of the possible. Reconciliation is a calling it is the very essence of costly discipleship in which Christians say we follow Jesus, called by the same God, exposed to the same risks, and led by the same spirit. Now in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul tells us that long before we knew it, God was already at work reconciling the world to God's self, not counting their transgressions against them. And then God interrupted God's work, making room for us 
in entrusting to us the ministry of reconciliation so that we, having become a new creation and urged on by the love of Christ, are now called to be what the Bible says, ambassadors of Christ in the work of reconciliation. But we should note two further things. Even as we are new in Christ, Paul says, and reconciled to God in Christ, Christ still entreats us, be reconciled to God. That means that to do the work of reconciliation is no easy thing. It calls for daily conversion, daily commitment, daily obedience, with renewed reconciliation with God if we are to respond to that calling. It is necessary. It is necessary. For if in order to reconcile the world with God, Jesus had to give up his life, what in the world makes us think that we will get away with something less than that? Secondly, whereas first God worked without us, now that we have been called to this ministry of reconciliation, we have become co-workers with God. For that reason, Paul's proclamation of the ministry of reconciliation does not end with chapter 5, verse 21, as we are sometimes prone to think. It ends, in fact, with chapter 6, verse 13. And in truth, we are not able to do this work on our own. It is simply too hard. And once we commit to this work, we should be ready for every challenge. And this is how Paul describes this challenge in chapter 6, verses 4 to 10. And he does not mince any words. He says, we are facing great endurance, afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, unrewarded labors, sleepless nights, hunger. But this, on the other hand, he says, is how we endure in this work. By purity, knowledge, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech. But we should remember that we are not alone because we stand not in our own might, but in the power of God, Paul says, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Now this that I've just described, has got nothing to do with the so-called and so often invoked political realism of the balance of power. Neither has it anything to do with the tired and convenient political experiences of the so-called National Democratic Revolution. And neither has it anything to do with what that vacuous excuse for our own moral and political frivolousness we call Madiba magic. Paul says this because he has learned what reconciliation is and what it is not. Whereas the classic Greek writers in Paul's time used the word reconciliation for peace treaties and political agreements and personal relationships, they always use the word speaking as representatives of the Greek empire. Now for the empire, reconciliation always meant to become reconciled with the goals of the empire, with the will of the emperor, and with what is good for the empire. Reconciliation was the pacification, in other words, the subjection of weaker nations. It was to make peace with the lies of the empire, to meekly accept the injustices inflicted by the empire on the vanquished, the poor and the oppressed. Reconciliation was to meekly endure the violence of the empire, to remain silent in the face of mendacity, dishonesty and brutality in the knowledge that if we did remain silent, one would be richly rewarded by the empire's corrupt systems of patronage. And so the violent subjugation of nations was naturally seen as an effort to reconcile those barbarians with the empire and the strife caused by their resistance 
and celebrate their submission to and their assimilation into the empire by accepting the domination the empire imposed. That was reconciliation captured by empire. The Pauline emphasis on reconciliation, however, comes from his understanding of the life and the message and the death on the cross and the resurrection of a Roman colonial subject named Jesus from the town of Nazareth in the occupied territory of Galilee. Paul preached a gospel in which every call to reconcile with God meant resistance to the reconciliation of empire. A reminder that one cannot call Jesus Lord and be reconciled with the emperor who considered himself God, son of God, prince of peace, morning star, giver of life and savior of the world. All these titles the emperor claimed for himself, but all these titles now the early church claimed instead for Jesus, the revolutionary peasant from Galilee, the one who embraced the status of a slave and as the lowest of the low in Roman society claimed his place as the true son of God and the true savior of the world. For the early church, reconciliation meant that there is, to quote Paul from the letter to the Galatians, no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. That is reconciliation because it demands radical inclusivity and it is real, it is revolutionary, and it is radical. For the early church it meant proclaiming Christ who, and now he writes to the Colossians, disarmed the rulers and authorities of the empire, made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them. That is reconciliation because it puts earthly powers precisely in their place, reminding them that God alone is God. As a rich, privileged, slave-holding member of Roman society, to quote just one example from the New Testament, it is necessary that this man called Philemon, in order not to set any dangerous exceptions, and to keep the slaves in their place and the slave masters secure and the slave political economy intact that Philemon should now go and find and severely punish his runaway slave called Onesimus. But as a follower of Jesus, he can no longer reconcile himself to the rules and obligations of Roman society. So instead, he will, so Paul writes to Philemon, welcome Onesimus, no longer as a slave, and not only as a brother in Christ, but as a beloved brother in the flesh. That is a fundamental reversal of Roman political, societal, and economic rules. And that is reconciliation, because it is real, it is radical, and it is revolutionary. Now, this understanding has all sorts of consequences for us. I understand biblical reconciliation to be this. It is not possible without acknowledging the alien nation that now calls for reconciliation. It is not possible without confronting the evil of the past and the evil of the present, including the evil within ourselves that refuses to acknowledge the evil of the past and the evil of the present because that evil and its denial is to our benefit. It is not possible without remorse and repentance. Reconciliation is not possible without forgiveness. Reconciliation is not possible without justice. And finally, reconciliation is only possible amongst equals. Now let us, for a moment, reflect on our South African experience. If we 
had taken this understanding of reconciliation seriously and not succumbed to the delusions of reconciliation politics, we would not have been in the dire situation we now find ourselves in. Everything we learn about reconciliation in the Gospels is more real, more radical, more revolutionary, more inclined toward justice, more integrity, dignity, inclusivity, and humanity than anything we have been offered in the politics of South Africa's so-called national democratic revolution. As a prophetic church, that church that embraced and helped lead the struggle for liberation, we did not remain as vigilant in the new dispensation under the African National Congress as we were in the time of the white apartheid minority regime. We surrendered as a church the terrain of our prophetic faithfulness and allowed it to become the playground of political expediency and propaganda. So before we knew it, former President Thabo Mbeki and then Minister Trevor Manuel and presently President Jacob Zuma and Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa were more adept at quoting the Bible to expound their own particular brand of state theology than we were able to offer prophetic witness standing on the truth of that very same Bible. And we listened happily helpless when they lectured us on it. We confused Nelson Mandela, South Africa, a nation at peace with itself and with the world, with the shalom of the kingdom of God. And we did that because as a church, we no longer stood where Christ stands and is always to be found, namely with the poor, the oppressed, and the wounded. Instead, we found our place and we took the elevated and lofty view from the hill where the union buildings stand and no longer looked from the depths of the flooded valleys of misery and poverty where the neglected and the destitute still cry out for freedom and justice. We have identified with Pharaoh, not because Pharaoh had let God's people go, but because the Pharaoh now looked like us. Finally, and perhaps more important than we dare to admit, in a much more intimate but simultaneously spiritual and political way, as we became more and more mesmerized by Mr. Mandela, we became more and more embarrassed by Jesus. That meant, as a matter equally grave, that as we became, with the politics of the day, more and more obsessed with reconciliation as a national project, we became less and less possessed of risk reconciliation as a biblical imperative. We did not recognize the drummed up optimism of a captured mass media as really stage for our consumption. And we mistook our own euphoria for the joy of the Lord. Enchanted by the spirit of the times, we let go of the hand of the spirit of reconciliation entrusted to us by God. Now, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission started their work, they created a terrain where the prophetic voice of the church could and should have been vitally decisive. I'm not speaking of the willingness or unwillingness of certain churches to appear before the commission. I am rather speaking of a bold intervention in the processes of reconciliation itself, of taking the initiative to define reconciliation, not to protect the purity of its Christian nature, but in order to prevent it from becoming no more than a form of political pietism and manipulation. To ensure that a term so intrinsically biblical should not become too easily estranged from its radical character too easily reduced to an excuse for the domestication of justice and consequently of the continuation of injustice. We never publicly, consistently, and prophetically 
proclaimed reconciliation not as a handy tool for and a relatively harmless result of politically negotiated settlements, but as a radical biblical demand, even though we were aware of how reconciliation as a recognizably Christian concept became almost the very hallmark of our reconciliation process. We did not remind the nation that if reconciliation is to be durable and sustainable, it has to be radical and revolutionary and that reconciliation in order to be real has to be effectively and attentively translated into political and socioeconomic realities with the restoration of justice at the heart of it. We did not insist publicly, prophetically, and consistently what we have known from the beginning and actually preached during the struggle, that reconciliation is not possible without genuine confrontation of evil, that reconciliation is not possible without equality, which means profound and fundamental shift in our power relations. Neither is reconciliation possible without the restoration of justice, human dignity, and hope. We forgot to remind the nation that reconciliation is not possible without restitution. I do not mean reparation, which has surfaced in the debates around reconciliation in South Africa. I mean restitution, which is hardly ever mentioned most importantly, we did not proclaim as loudly as we could that reconciliation is costly, that it is never cheap, and that a miracle such as we claim our own transition to be becomes valueless if it is divorced from the costliness of remorse, repentance, restitution, and the restoration of justice and the consequences of this for our politics. We did not publicly consistently and prophetically insist that whichever way one describes it and despite its appropriation by politics or even its necessity for politics, forgiveness is not naturally a word from the political lexicon. One expects it rather at the end of a process of remorse and contrition and repentance and confession and conversion as perhaps a comma or a question. Forgiveness requires that fundamental shift in power relation that brings the equality without reconciliation is not possible. It's time to turn to the story of Zacchaeus. Now, all of you know that he was an extremely rich man. He was also an extremely hated man because he superintended the exploitative and oppressive tax regime installed by the Roman Empire on the poor in the countries that they occupied. Zacchaeus' wealth gained from the oppression and exploitation of first century Palestinian peasants, as economist St. Peter Blanche says of white people in South Africa, was undeserved wealth, gained from the undeserved exploitation and undeserved impoverishment of indigenous peoples from the days of colonization until the present time. Zacchaeus not only received his rewards from the Roman authorities for collecting taxes, he also took a percentage of whatever his agents collected and he took the proceeds from extortion and theft. If tax collectors in general were a hated crowd, then Zacchaeus as chief tax collector was hated most of all. And I believe that Zacchaeus chose that tree to visit, to wait for Jesus, not only because he was short in stature, but because sitting in a tree was the safest place for him that day, uh, given how much he was detested by the people. Uh, in response to Jesus' announcement of sharing a meal with Zacchaeus and his family, this reviled man shows us, in fact, what true reconciliation is. I apologize to those uh, who cannot follow Afrikaans, but I have to tell story in Afrikaans. Anders work it not eat. Now, Basil Kivido, one of the wonderfulste story vertellers that I know all the time, tell about 
Die zit in de kamer en oom je je wat preek op zondag aan. Oor sy tjies. En oom je je sê vir die gemeente, sy tjies is al wonderlijke man. Hy sê, toe sy tjies op die radio hoor, dat die jyre kom hier langs, Toe sê sy tjies vir sy vrou, vrou, ek gaan. En sy vrou pak vir hom een lunch, en hy vat het saam, en hy klim in die boom, en hy wacht. Maar het is een lang wacht, want die jyre wil nie kom nie. En toe sy tjies honger raak, sê om die eetje, toe maak hy sy lunch op, en hy eet van die poloni sandwich, en van die stikkie kentakkie wat sy vrou vir hom ingesit het. En hy kyk so af en die mens raak al hoe meer en al hoe meer en sy gees raak bang en hy sê, jylle kom hier maar ek ga nie afklim nie, want jylle likes my niks voet sê ek jylle allemaal. En hy sê, maar uiteindelik toe die jyre kom en staan onder die boom en hy kyk op en sê, hy sê, jyres, wow, hier kom het nou. Maar toe die jyre sy naam noem en sê, hy sê, jyres, klim af. Toe kom hy, hy val om trend uit die boom uit, sê oom jy. En toe is hoe voor die jyres daar, en die jyres sê vir my, sy tjies, ek wil vandaan by jou huis kom dinner. Toe spring sy tjies op, en hy sê, jyre, hou net vast. Ek kom nou, en hy haarkloop weg, en sê vir sy vrou, my vrou, maak recht, die jyre kom vandaan by ons dinner. Maar jy moet iets specials maak. Maak vir ons een poikie. Maak een afvalpoikie. En maak een kerryafvalpoikie want die Heere like sy afval, en die Heere like sy kerry. Now this man is a case. I draw attention to him to illustrate what it can mean if we take reconciliation seriously. I draw ten lessons from him. First, Zacchaeus acknowledged his personal complicity in the exploitation of others and his benefit from a system of oppressing others. Zacchaeus did not try to defend himself like we do by arguing that he had to make a living one way or the other, that this was merely his job, that he didn't can help me, or that he had a family to look after. He knew that he had unjustly benefited from systematized oppression and suffering. Second, reconciliation requires both acknowledgement of guilt and remorse for that oppression. This is what Zacchaeus does. It also requires acknowledging that the victim has a right to restitution. It has got nothing to do with my own magnanimity. It is all about justice. It is acknowledging my victim's pain as a result of what I had done to her and making it right with acts of justice. Third, reconciliation is not merely spiritual. It calls for acts of justice, real and tangible gains for the victims of oppression. Pledging to give half of his possessions to the poor and to pay back fourfold what he had stolen was not a simple, symbolic gesture. It was an act of restitution required in order to make repentance result in justice rather than merely an assuagement of guilt. Fourth, Zacchaeus knows reconciliation is not possible without equality. Offering justice is a way of asking forgiveness and genuine remorse requires a fundamental shift in power relations. And by divesting himself of half his wealth and then restoring four times whatever he had stolen from the poor made Zacchaeus different. He removed himself from the exclusive club of the wealthy in Jericho to become a man of the people. Fifth, repentance and reconciliation involves more than restoring our broken relationships with God. It is also about broken relationships with others. 
especially those whom we have damaged with our arrogance, greed, violence, and lust for power and domination. Six, Zacchaeus did not treat this as a private moment just between him and Jesus, just as his sins were not just between him and God. Unlike David, who you remember from Psalm 51, who prayed against you and you alone have I sinned, Zacchaeus does none of that. Uh, he, he, he knows that he cannot be like David who says, forgive me to God, but doesn't even speak to Bathsheba and Uriah, whom he had damaged in the first place. And so, so, so he treated them as not worthy of his repentance and his remorse. Zacchaeus publicly acknowledged his sins against the people whom he had victimized, robbed, and oppressed, and he backed his remorse by his public expression to restoration with those he had harmed by his sins. Seven, uncovering the sin and showing remorse and repentance and storing relationships with deed of compassionate justice makes clear that then and only then is reconciliation complete and right and sustainable because it becomes transformational. That is its salvific power. Eight, genuine reconciliation not only results in personal salvation, but brings salvation for Zacchaeus and his house, the story says. So not only Zacchaeus, but also his children benefited from the wealth generated by systemic oppression and by his thievery. But undeserved, stolen, generational wealth also brings unrelieved, unforgiven generational guilt. And so not only Zacchaeus, but also his children were released from the curse of generational guilt and shame that comes with systemic oppression and exploitative relationships. Nine, repentance and reconciliation impelled Zacchaeus to confront and denounce his life of comfort and self-enrichment as a functionary of Roman imperialism and to convert to a value system focused on divine justice rather than imperial dictates and personal perks. And this is what Dr. Martin Luther King meant when he spoke of the need for a radical revolution of values. 10. Genuine reconciliation produces a new identity. Reconciliation changed Zacchaeus from being a hated chief tax collector to becoming, the Bible says, a son of Abraham. Reconciliation not only changes the way we feel, it transforms us into agents of God's love, God's justice, and God's reconciliation. If we have to apply that to South Africa, it would mean that white South Africans, if they would do all of this, would, instead of remaining children of colonialists and imperialists, can become children of the soil. So it is with reconciliation that we have to deal. Uh, and it is not setting the bar too high. Reconciliation is the fruit of the revolution that we escaped in the 1980s. Not doing justice to reconciliation invites, in my view, a postponed revolution. And if we do this as indispensable for politics and a society that is more just, humane, and dignified, and determinately, unapologetically, unashamedly inclusive. It does not merely authenticate our faith, it actually guarantees the integrity of our democratic intentions. So if we speak of reconciliation, what believes a chaos and his challenge sitting in that tree, we will have missed the meaning and the transformational power of the story. When Zacchaeus came down from that tree to face the victims of his own rapaciousness, he saw for the first time 
through the imperial mendacity that blinded him to the truth. Facing them with true repentance also broke the chains of greed that opened him to capture by the Roman Empire. But South Africans, may brothers and sisters, if anything, are a spiritual people. We are a resilient people. We are a hopeful people. We did remarkable things in the past and we will do remarkable things again. Our whole history is one of small but significant and life-changing miracles. We struggled for justice and freedom in ways that made us the inspiration of millions across the earth. When we were told that the world had given up on us, we persevered. The horrors were unspeakable and the adversaries of a fierce and awesome evil, but we struggled on and we won. The face, in the face of a horrific past, we chose for reconciliation instead of revenge and retribution. We chose for justice for the living rather than vengeance for the dead. And the fact that this incredible magnanimity and the almost unheard of generosity of spirit have not been responded to with the healing humility of repentance and the restorative, the restorative reciprocity of justice must not make us doubt that fundamental rightness and the foundational righteousness of that decision. We are of a people, President Thabo Mbeki once said, who refuse to bow to oppression. He is right. We are also of a people who refuse to forget our struggles, our sacrifices, and the dreams that lifted us up above every adversity, every attack, every demand for submission. We are of a people who believe in God as a God of justice and freedom. We have begun something extraordinary and we must resist those, whoever they might be, black or white, from the union buildings to every capital of every province to every boardroom of the privileged corporatist classes who want to diminish our sacrifices crush our dreams and steal the future of our children. We must not abide by a reconciliation that is not real or not radical and not revolutionary. But on this road, we must not make the imperfect our yardstick, nor the mediocre our consolation. We must not measure our progress by the comfort of the rich, but by the character of the justice we do to the poor and vulnerable. Judgment on our walk toward our God-ordained destiny must not be taken from the privileged or the pampered circles of the powerful, but from the powerless, those whom Jesus calls the least of these. The authority with which we govern in this country must not be derived from the approval of the mighty and the boastful, but must rest upon the hopes of the poor and the ones of unimpressive proportions in whom the living God has invested the hope for life and where our hope for life is to be found. Where we stand today, genuine reconciliation with justice at its heart is only set aside for a little while. 23 years are not a marker for a moment beyond sanity or redemption. Now, we may be confused, but we are not mindless. We are bewildered, but not crushed. We are battered, but not beaten down, cheated out of our expectations, but not robbed of our dreams. We are perplexed, but not hopeless. We are lost, but not irredeemable. Reconciliation always at the heart of all our struggles throughout the centuries is still alive and it is beckoning. We can, if we want to, still recover it, reclaim it, re-embrace it, and act it. But unless we call Zacchaeus out of that tree, our sacred spaces 
where we come together to find hope and strength and faith and courage for the work we have to do in South Africa and the world and our public spaces where we hope to reclaim our place with righteous protest for the cause of justice will be no more than the resounding echo chambers of our own cries of desperation and helplessness. Uh, they have to be more than places of sentimental mourning for days gone by. Uh, they have to become spaces of conversion and commitment and salvation and spaces of inspiration for faithful, truthful, prophetic action so that the world may become a sacred space for God's mercy, God's love, and God's compassionate justice. And because of that, becomes a place safe for the politics of integrity and decency and for the lives, the hopes, the dreams of our children and of all who are vulnerable today. The time for that work is now and the ones called for that work are us. I thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Dr. Busak. So we're opening up for questions, discussion, dialogue. Um, yeah, we'd like to hear from the floor now. Anybody would like to pose a question, make a comment on the speech, or if you've read the book, the floor is open. Okay, thank you. Do we have a mic that's roving or? Okay, maybe you can just project. Yes. Good evening. First of all, thank you so much, Dr. Busak, for that fabulous speech and uh, inspiring and enlightening. Um, thank you. This tiny person stuck a microphone in my face. <laughs> I think my question is, and Please take it in, in, in the spirit in which it is given, which is in no way a desire to lessen or undermine or nullify in any way damage, danger, destruction of the apartheid regime or the, the, the years that came before that of exploitation of the people of South Africa. But where do you see Zacchaeus in the ANC regime? Because I still think he's up in the tree with Zuma. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't understand where that debate, that the years between 94 and now, I don't, see where, I don't know where they factor in, in your debate. I, I'm not being critical. I'm just saying I don't actually see. And I would love to know if they factor, where they factor. Um, and if you feel the time has maybe been too short in the light of the time that went before that, I don't really know. So if you could, where is Zacchaeus now in the ANC? Thank you. So we'll take another two and then uh, Dr. Busak will respond. Good evening. Um, I'm Amelia from Annenberg. I think my one... For the last few weeks, I think that there was something that I wanted to say to, to and I, I'm specifically not going to say doctor, because I want to get the ground equal to us as, as individuals. Um, Alan, is that when, and, and I might be out of order, but when you were, were, were charged with that case, um, none of us, we were so captured, all of us, we were so captured, that we were only looking out for ourselves at the time and said, let they deal with whatever it is, although we knew it was not true. We stood along, and I think for the last 23 years, we've experienced this in our communities where um, activists were, were criminalized, and everyone was just quiet about it, 
because actually you didn't toe the line. And I think that story of, of I'm not sure whether, because in your, you, some way you are saying that you didn't testify as a, as a, in your case. You didn't deliver a witness in your case. And, and, and was that part of the, the reconciliation within yourself in terms of the truth that we suppose uh, um, not to stand for because the Anglo-Roman Dutch law is still very much the, the framework that's governing us in this country. And we're not saying, and, and all of us are captured within this. So we close our eyes for the right things, for, for the wrong things, and we just abide with, with what the stream is saying to us. So I want to say publicly, I want to apologize as an individual for closing my eyes, looking away, and let that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one more question, and then we'll ask um, Alan to respond. Hi, my name is Frank Smith. I'm better known as Koi Frank. Kila Baoip. It means Khoisan Erlief. I'm the president of the Khoisan Revolution. My point that I wish to bring over to Dr. Busak is we are living in the not too distant past now when we do this type of thing in speeches and all about black and white. The people that are suffering now is the Khoisan people. And if I look around me, I see the majority of people here are from Khoisan descent. It is our people that are not getting jobs. It is our people that are being robbed of positions. It is our people that is being deprived of a lot of things. Very soon, very soon, my people, we will rise up and there will be no looking back. Thank you. The question is, Dr. Busak, where do you stand on this and how do you see it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me first begin um, with the comrade from Bonte Hivel to say thank you very much for Manenberg, is it Manenberg, excuse me, from Manenberg to say thank you very much uh, for your words. Um, I do not want to say too much uh, because these are things that cause wounds that don't heal as easily as one might think. And I will not hide it from you. It is true that my family and I looked around in those days and we saw very few. Um, while we are grateful for the love and the loyalty of many, um, I, and we always said, I'm not going to rehash this thing and I'm not going to fight. I mentioned it once in the book that I wrote in 2009. And we have decided we will not raise this ever again in public until God gives South Africa's people the wisdom and the insight and the humility to see what injustice has been done for themselves. And what you are doing tonight, um, I thank you um, for that. Um, and much of what we dis are seeing today uh, and the way in which things are being interpreted and done are almost a direct result of our embrace of that injustice for whatever reason and our running away from the truth for whatever reason. Now almost, what is it, 15 years ago? Um, uh, but I thank you very much. It means um, a lot. I thought that the whole lecture was a, a fairly critical assessment of where we are in our politics today and where we are in the response of our churches today and civil society. And so, I thought I made it clear where the ANC was in all of this. The ANC was in charge since 1994. I talked about secret talks before that. That was the ANC. 
um, so ek het hulle genoeg gesê, hulle weet waar hulle staan. And they know, um, and that is why we want to raise this conversation, so that we can engage also the African National Congress in this conversation. Um, if they are ready to talk, uh, because if they are ready to talk without Zacchaeus, then there's not going to be much of a conversation. And there's not going to be much of a change for them. So if they want genuinely to save their own organization with its amazing history uh, and capturing the nobility of our struggle for such a long time, if they want to save that, they've got to open themselves to a new, honest conversation with integrity so that we can see what we can do to save our country. Um, and for me, as important as the ANC is politically, to save our people is more important than saving an organization. Um, and that is our, that's our point of departure. Bru Frank, um, and maybe I should say this uh, very clearly. I wish um, that we could just raise um, the question and talk. I know you don't always have the opportunity to have these many people to put your case, and I understand that. But let me be clear. I don't want us to become victims of an attitude of victimhood. I know the so-called colored people in this country have been dealt a very unfair blow since 1994. The way that affirmative action has been reinterpreted by successive governments has been wrong. The way that they when they came back from exile, overturned 20, 30 years of struggle to get away from racial categories. And the moment they came back and opened their mouth, we were all of a sudden, we overcame all of that in the UDF. We had a non-racial, non-violent militant movement going. <laughs> and the moment they came back, all of a sudden, to work, ek is om weer clear lang. I didn't want that. And as some of you Africans, and as some of you Indians, and some of you Vietnamese, say, while in the struggle, we, we work together, we pray together, we suffer together, we went to jail together. And so, I know all of that, but you must not say that the colored people are the people who suffer most. We suffer, but we do not suffer most. There are 60 million people in this country who live in dire poverty. And it's the fault of our government because of their deals with the white corporatist classes between 1985 and 1994 and their choice of a political economic policy called new liberal capitalism. And we put on the table other options that they refuse to discuss. So when you have capitalism that has inherently within itself the need for inequality so that the greed can be satisfied for the few, then you can't continue with that kind of policy in the new situation. Then you turn around and you are surprised that the gap between, I must say the gap, I must say the abyss between the rich and the poor in this country is now wider than it ever was under apartheid. And that white people, white people who were already rich before 1994 are now four or five times as rich. That's, 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 that's hang on, hang on, hang on, Frankie, it's, no, it's my aunt. So, I understand all of that, but you know what will save us? Let us not give those people who wanted the satisfaction.
of dividing ourselves as we were divided in the days of Abba. Let's fight for justice all together. Let's recognize in one another that which made us so unique and so powerful. Let's not, let, let's not, I mean, that is a slap rim die, my bro. And we shouldn't be caught in it. If we come together, and we claim again the values that we had that carried us through days and days and years and decades of struggle and made us triumphant at the end of that struggle. If we recapture those values and we come together as a people, imagine what we can do now. I, for one, am not giving up on my non-racialism. I'm not giving up on all of these issues. I, and I want our people I mean, if you had to talk categories, the so-called colored people of the Cape were at the heart of the struggle. Every meaningful campaign that the UDF launched started here. Don't give that up. Don't let it go. But let's not do this in this way. Let's be strong, let's be open, let's be clear, and let's set our goals so that we can set the new example for where we are going to as a country and as a people. I, I, I hope that you hear me and that you understand me in this, my brother. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we've got one hand there, one hand there, and then I think uh, we've got some people online. Rudy's got someone online, so we'll start with this gentleman. and. Move on, the, on that side. Uh, Prof. Stephen. Uh, yeah, I'm going to get uh, you, When you said Zakir's offer to change his whole personal situation in order to benefit others, I immediately had the struggle within me about capitalism. Yes. Because capitalism is to keep, to get and to keep, and to not to share. How in God's name are we going to change this current system in South Africa to benefit those who don't have and to restore the dignity of those who were left behind and who were bereft all this time of, of what should have been theirs, to keep it short. Uh, Dr. Postak, thank you so much for an excellent, challenging talk. I, I wish I was five times richer. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not my particular story, but one thing I would be very interested to hear is, obviously, restitution is a critical element of reconciliation. And in the complex society that we live in, with the legal system that we currently have in place and its respect for private property rights, etc., how do you practically envisage that type of restitution taking place, which I think self-evidently would not necessarily be an entirely voluntary process. Do you have specific solutions or proposals that you would put forward for that? Rudy, is it okay? Okay, uh, there were two uh, hands on that side. Shall we take one and then we, yeah, on that side first, yeah. Good evening, my name is Ahmed um, I'm an activist from Bonjeville. I'm really honored to, to hear you speak, um, doctor, and I, I actually want to um, call on the past in terms of my memory and my upbringing of stories of the days of the UDF, and that uh, when I think of liberation theology, um, I always have a, a, a nostalgic moment because I can't think of contemporary leaders who, who, have, who are serious in terms of liberation theology. And when you talk about reconciliation um, politically and publicly, 
I struggle with that because I can't imagine um, that there would be separate um, identifications or definitions. Because when we say the political is personal and you have a relationship with Christ, then um, you're cutting it in the middle again. So I feel like it's, it gets problematic when we have um, where, where these certain definitions apply to certain cases. And um, I want to make a practical example. The practical example is um, my brother and I are 15 years apart. Um, and when he was eight years old, I'm 30 now, we were driving um, da, um, somewhere in Blickisdorp, and he looked up at the uh, illegal um, electricity connections, and he said to my mother, look, mommy, they're stealing electricity. And I tapped him on his shoulder, and I said, you know what? Jesus paid it all. <laughs> now, yeah, sure, you're going to laugh at that, but now... Um, why, don't we, why are we not laughing at the metaphors presented to us tonight even? So my question is, when, we, when, when, when you speak within the framework of liberation theology, then the response that Jesus paid it all shouldn't be funny. It should be reality, it should be radical, and it should be transformational. Yes. Thank you. Would you like to respond? Well, once again, thank you for uh, these questions. Um, Stephen, uh, you are absolutely right. How on earth are we going to change the system? By beginning to think differently. We are made to believe that capitalism is a salvific system. It saves us from whatever. Um, we got to change that. We got to think more critically about what kind of economic systems there are. When we debated this in the 1990s, um, I was actually one of those who tried to make the point that the ANC was not faced, as we were told, by only two stark choices. One is the centralized economic system in communism, and the other is new liberal capitalism. I try to argue that there are places in the world where a different kind of economic system, social democracy, is much better suited for our situation than liberal capitalism. But again, that debate was not really allowed. I'll never forget, I won't name names. So I won't name names. But when, when, when in the 1980s, early 1980s, I spoke at UWC and I talked about social democracy as a better system for us. And there was a person in the room who was quite upset with me, who attacked me and said, do you want to bring in capitalism by the back door? I was the 1980s. Diamond for dach. Yeah. Wolf apostle. <laughs> but you know, it's a question of, it's a question of policies. And so we've got to push that in the public debate and say, we want a different system. It's not, I mean, I do not, I mean, at the moment, we are captured by new liberal capitalism, by the corporatist classes of the world out there and in here. The whole capture debate is not about the interests of the people of South Africa as visa geld, what altijd die country geran het, wat nou nie nou gevaar is, moet nou weer ander manse geld, wat nou die country wil ran, nou wil ek hom beklee. It's a, it's a fight between two corporatist classes here. From both sides of the river. But it's not about our people, it's not about poverty, it's not about justice, it's not about dignity. 
So we've got to think differently about that, but it's possible. Um, uh, uh, we shouldn't give up. There are enough clever people in this country who have studied economics and systems and things like that who are quite willing to think with us on how that could happen. Um, the question of the restitution is, of course, is a very difficult question. And we cannot talk about restitution vaguely as in restitution of justice without the land. You're absolutely right. Well, think about our constitution because you, you, you mentioned um, our legal system. Our constitutions, our constitution, let me first say this, is one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. The way it protects the rights and the dignity of everybody. LGBTQI, women, children, that is marvelous. I praise God for that. But the longest clause in our constitution is the clause on private property. Why is that? Who wrote that thing? To please whom? Because they knew then already had hulle het klaar een deal gemaakt en gaan nooit jou land en jou geld vat. So they write it in the constitution. Now when we raise it, everybody gets upset. Oh, he wants to change the constitution. I think the constitution has to change on that point. We've got to have a civilized debate on that particular issue. So that we can talk. Because you cannot have, you cannot have um, equality if the land question is not. I mean, who is it moeilijk dat een wit familie 30 plaats heeft? Of 28? Of 20? Of 15? No, 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 but that, that's, there's something wrong with that. Um, and the Pope said there's something wrong with it and we must not be afraid to say it. Ik denk die Pope is great, hij is recht. So we, we, we have to talk about how do we go about that. That's the first point. The second point, of course, is in the last 20 years or so that the ANC has been in charge, there has been some land redistribution. But how? Why was it not obvious for everybody to see that if you want to have land redistribution, if you want to give people back the land that their foreparents had owned a century ago. But now we are in a situation with modernized agricultural methods. How can you just give people land back without training them how to use these new methods? Without making sure that they know what they're doing. So we give them the land back and so how as more as excuse me, I don't know the land and what do you do? There was also a bit of a slop rim. Um, but also, I, I also know there has been land distribution. I would like to see a register of the land distribution. Who got what? Want daar is land weggegeven, maar voor wie? Al my pellies en al my chommies en al my niggies en al my nevies. So we got to watch that. And we got to ask the question, what do we do? And it's, and it's not frivolous, and, and, and I, what do we do with deep, deep, deep historic things? So in that sense, the indigenous people of this country have a right to put the issue on the table. We must just talk about how can we do this in the best way. But justice has to be done. Recognition has to be most can mark us off. You can't do that because I won't be quiet just because you tell me that. We've got to think about what this means. We've got to also say, if we are going to redistribute the land, who's going to be in charge of all of that? Well, I don't know if I'm in the government, trust me. So, so all these issues need to be discussed within a framework. But let me just say once again, you don't have to threaten anybody. We don't we need to say, oh, we're um, All we need to say is we will raise this issue and we will raise them continuously and we'll raise them with dignity. We will raise them with insistence and we won't let you get away with it anymore. That's all we're saying. 
because as a if i just think politically then you got to know that unless we address these issues we will sit with a time bomb that will blow up in our faces so if i just want peace for our people i got to talk about this and then it means that i cannot be so involved in all hierdie goeders wat ons nou sien dat ek tyd daarmee so i got to make time so you got to find somebody who we put in charge who actually has time for the questions of justice who has time for the interest of the people who has time for the future of our children and if i were in the anc and i would be able to vote in december i would raise that question who of you actually have proved to me that you have time for our people instead of just your rich pelts so those are the issues oh bonti yes the lady <laughs> it's it's that's so wonderful and ek het gelag want ek het het gesien kom is so great die story we dropped the church uh, the church dropped the ball I, i must say that that's why i'm so critical of the church in this paper the prophetic church that you knew who got shot at in bontiwel with church of the ascension met die begrafnis van ashley kill die kerk is nie meer daar nie that church embraced liberation theology that church knew that be there there is no tension between the salvation of my life in Jesus name and the saving of my people in Jesus name we know that but you go where we are studying theology here you ask the question who teaches this how do we read the bible today while we knew how to read the bible in the 1980s the kairos document the belhar confession all of those are clear about how the bible should be understood but we are sunk now in south africa in a flood of fundamentalist theological things that come not from us but from over there the united states sending its disciples its apostles of imperialism to teach us a religion that is not the religion of our savior the lord jesus christ and unless we take those issues seriously we've got to recreate a new a new generation of theologians a new generation of preachers a new generation of christians who know that the jesus who stood up in the synagogue in luke chapter 4 and talked about the good news to the poor and the release of the captives and the liberation of the oppressed that's the jesus who saved my soul ek is nie bang of skaam om dit te sê nie ek kom van 'n plek af in die platteland waar ons 'n koortjie gesing het ek skaam my nie vir die evangelie nie want dis 'n krag van god tot redding of course it is and that's why the politicians who i mean i got and i don't learn these things from marx or engels that was almost by bright with me and the glue is is nice it's fine but every radical thought i have in my mind i got from the bible i tell you that so if we embrace the bible as the explosive dangerous revolutionary book that it is meant to be and we preach that book from the pulpit sunday after sunday and we teach our preachers this is what you should say we will change this country we will transform the world we will revolutionize our society and we will put those places the people who in power in high places we will put them in the place where they belong and that's what we should be aiming for Do we have time for another one more question that man had his hand up for quite a while on that side and then okay the two just these two last hands Uh thank you Ellen uh, my name is Gatto van die Chachis uh Menenberg Yeah uh Mario Mario Yeah Is a vraag ja, ek gaan nie speeches maak, jy vraag, ek gaan vraag vraag. Eh, 
you keep referring to the days of the struggle it was in samkistan in the struggle is for bay ma for us mense het die struggle nog nooit opgehou nie so ek het 'n probleem met die stelling wat jy bly maak in die daag van die struggle wan ons die mense het die boere bang gemaak nie die eiens hier nie ons die mense en ons moet vir die mense gaan sê te maaf dat ons vir julle geseer het maak 'n krisis by die eiens hier die eiens is deel van ons verlede maar ons moet ons laer af van die vlag wan uit die boere se kalles en uit die eiens se kalles and they don't represent us as the indigenous people en ons moet by daai punt kom waar ons sê die struggle het nie geëindig nie imperialism did not end in 1994 apartheid did not end in 1994 the crime is still continuing as net ons se mense met hulle bee deals wat nou sit met die rykdom en as hulle wil foun sê kom reeds uh ons bekeer 50 rand like soos vanaand we've us anybody to help us with petrol money you want go na rani so Mario. we are just as guilty mario as a new apartment as a belief oh, sorry man. as a belief thank you die vraag die vraag is die struggle het het geëindig die da party die imperialism in okay. in 1994 okay. okay 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 thank you thank you here in front yeah okay hi <laughs> chess uh dr busak my name is yuna i'm a koi activist and i'm a journalist um i'm your last comments about the aboriginal koi people the people you just made my you, uh, my heart uh happier uh, uh, i just feel uh, much happier when i heard you speaking about the indigenous people um it is a historical fact that this land belonged to the koi people it is a historical fact that we lost our land we lost the identity we lost everything and therefore we are the people that suffered the most since not since uh, 1912 but since the european colonial came to our uh, south africa and southern africa i just want to, to to ask you you uh we cannot as you rightly said you said that um you know the 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 koi people were at the heart of the struggle the apartheid struggle we 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 uh were were directly uh 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 responsible uh we it, it's because of us that South Africa are free today because the ANC was in in exile you uh, uh had to face the the apartheid regime and you were instrumental so i was and we 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 were as, as a people we were deserted after the we we got liberation or so called liberation our people get faced with bee our children still dies on the cave flat uh we still be discriminated against and we st- stuck with a identity or a classification called colored so uh, the struggle is is really uh, our struggle has uh, hasn't stopped our struggle is still since it was when the europeans came here i just want to g- get some of your insights uh uh on this issue thank you thank you thank you go ahead um i like to pose a question on restorative justice um so my issue is that a lot of um convicts who come out of the prison system um if they want to look for a job or something it's obviously on the CV that they just come out of or being in prison. Um, and a lot of the convicts aren't taught of how to change the wrong that they've been, that, has, that they did, um, whether it's committing murder um, or anything, etc. like that. So my question is, then how do we get that kind of implementation put into place so we convicts are taught that the, what I did wrong um is not to be um 
repeated and how to change my ways. Because it point is just seen in someone to and come out or released like three months okay. or six months later. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Thank you once again for this last round of questions. Um, Mr. Wanza, um, when we had the launch, and this is quite a serious thing, I'm not making light of your question, but when we had the launch, I, I remember you, t you, you spoke there, and I asked you specifically, go and read the book. The book is about the fact that struggles are not over. It is all about that. That's the title. Pharaohs on both sides of the blood red waters, which means that we've had a struggle, we've gone through the Red Sea, so to speak, and when we came to the other side where we expected freedom, we were faced with the same kind of Pharaoh, only with the difference that the Pharaoh now looks like us. That's what the book is all about. So please don't say to me that I keep on saying the struggle is not over. When I see what I say, and the book said it daily, I said it year on. And I understand when people don't know. Madame said for men, read as a bloody book, so that nobody is under any misunderstanding. As amper as that tight to ons nu nog in die struggle gepreek het, en daar sien jy daar sit hulle in die tweede rei of in die derde rei, en traai hulle hulle tape recorders wegstiek. Toe sê ek vir hy ou, hom kroon staat, nee meneer, kom sit die zo voor, en bring jou tape recorder baie nabij, so dat jy mooi hoor wat ek sê. En ek gaan nou Engels praat, maar dan moet jy om Jace nog nader sit, want ek weet jylle te president, wat nie kan Engels praat nie, want hy het nie staan een tien geslaag. Dat was P.W. Boerders een tijd. Hij herinnert me gewoon zo, zo. En vraag me, ik wil, zo, lees net die boek. So that we can have a good conversation on the issues that I really raise. And we can have critical comments on the issues where you think you differ from me. That's what conversation is all about. Um, let me just say to you now, uh, I agree with you, of course. But you see, but also, we have to have proper conversations. Daar sit nou achter in die saal, a man wat a groot historiek is, is as the friend is van my, and he will tell you, the people who were the coy people, that we, or many of us, well, all of us, want die slim wit mense met die DNA toetse, sê vir ons, dat die eerste mense was hier in Afrika, by Ethiopie, en toe kom hulle af, hier na toe, so die DNA van amal van ons, het maak nie saak hoe wit jy miskien vanavond lyk nie, daar is maar temporary, want as jy nog 50 jaar lewe, en nog 100 jaar lewe, dan gaan hy witgeet alles weg, dan kom die kooi bloed uit, maar so daar is, that is true, but the, historically speaking, the people who struggled in the UDF were not the Khoi people as Khoi people. It was the people who were the descendants of the Khoi who played such an important role. The Khoi were the first people who faced the wrath of the imperialist and the colonialist who came here. And the first struggles for freedom were fought by those people. And I am proud that I get a bit of a little blood in my head. But that does not mean that I can now claim that the UDF, as I was saying, we, it, it couldn't have happened without us, but we were never alone in this. Um, Chris Hani and I spoke in Port Elizabeth, there was 30, 40,000 people. As I die mensen so for my gees roep, dan denk ek, joh. Daar is, daar is Zuid-Afrika, dat is ons mensen ook. Don't throw that away. And all of the grievances, really? Um, I can take you to Bontieval and Bishop Lavers and show you a starving child. But I can take you to Gooks and to Nyanga 
and to langa and show you starving children. We mustn't fight amongst each others. Beklee die skelms wat nou boos en wat maakt dat al ons kinders in die toekomst het nie. That's what we got to do. And I will continue to plead for that because once we can understand that basic principle of united action, daar gaat ons alles krak maak. En ek het vandag vir ou gesê, Mr. Uh, Fekele wat gesê het vir Dr. Koza, as jy die ANC aanvat, dan is het op een suicide mission wat jy gaan. Ek laat vir hom sê, wat is baie gevaarlik om dit te hoor. Maar, ek weet nie waar hy wees, maar ek het gestaan vir Louis Le Grand. En daar was ook een suicide mission. Maar Louis de Gransi bestaan nie vir daar gemeen, he is gone. And say apartheid is gone. All I'm saying is don't think because you're powerful today that you will last forever. The Bible says it is only a little while and the tyrant is gone. Ons in weer die tekste preek. Hier in Cornerstone ook terwijl ek nou die mic het. Um, and so those are the things that I think restorative justice is a is a totally different question because it deals not with even though they called it restorative justice in our reconciliation process it's actually a process that is inextricably linked with the prison system and with punishment that we have stepped away from in the reconciliation process so it's about how do you restore those who have done harm to society and there are three steps and one of the steps is you must make them and see that they have done wrong number two you must make them repay what they have taken so if i have stolen somebody's tv i must try and work and pay them back and third you must restore the relationship between the offender and the community but that's that, that's a different thing and you have prison ministries that I hope will do the right thing you have schools who deal with these things he works through sports with young people who have been offend, uh, offenders I preached in the Alsace River on Sunday morning and there was a young man a young man who went to jail for a double murder. Beautiful young kid. Mooi kind. And in prison, he uh, found the Lord. He changed his life. My Sammy Tom opgevang. And he's now a coach in soccer teams with other kids who were addicted and, and they get on a Friday night they get 80 to 100 of these young people in church and they gaan het so lekker hulle slaap oor vir saterdag oogend toe in die kerk and so that's what you do in terms of rehabilitation and I applaud people like that and I hope that we will again come together and join our efforts to make sure that when people come out of prison that they are not thrown back into the arms of the gangsters and that we can provide for them that we can create jobs for them that's another reason why government has to do its job better we can create jobs for those young people um, my vrou had a documentary gemaakt met Staghi and so Staghi was saying to her you go tell the government to create jobs for my people because I create jobs for my people alles het om drugs te verkoop but what kind of future is that? and so we're gonna we, we, we're gonna take back our lives and we have to take back our dignity and we have to take back our future we have to take back our purpose. We have to reclaim our destiny as a, as a people, as a country. And before we do all of that, we reclaim who we are. And I said it for Amal. I am a South African. My blood is soaked in the soil. 
my footprints walked on these beaches long before anybody else came. But I now share my humanity with all because the Freedom Charter says South Africa belongs to all who live in it. And just because those who wrote the charter have thrown the charter away, it does not mean that we cannot reclaim it back. And we rewrite it with all of these concerns. And we will say to them, unless you bring all our people with all our histories, all our pain and all our suffering together and all our joys and all our hopes, we will not stop until that becomes a reality. No, thank you so much. You've you been a wonderful audience. I really appreciate it. And please give a special hand to our chairperson for the evening, Ms. Desiree Paulson. Thank you. Thank you. And once again for Rosa Choir Yay. and Profound and for Cornerstone. Thank you, thank you very much. Just a few minutes to close off the evening. A huge thanks to Dr. Alan Busak and to his family for joining him at this very um, important event. I think uh, thank you for to the chair and um, uh, to Deidre, as um, Dr. Busak has said. Thank you to Cape Cultural Collective, to Profound, the team that pulled this together under Rudy Westerweg's leadership. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, you just really stepped up to the plate and did an absolutely amazing job with organizing this event. Um, we're very pleased about the media coverage um, that we're getting. Uh, Bush Radio has recorded this evening and will be broadcasting it. Um, Brenda, is there a date? You'll decide. And um, ETV was here. You might have seen their cameras, so there is some coverage there. We had some live streaming um, done for us by Hot uh, Coffee, Bradley Reiters and his team. Thank you very much. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been streamed um, so that we could reach more people. We are where we are. We are in Salt River. We are on the public route, uh, public transport route. We consider ourselves to be part of the community. Um, it is um, always a challenge to have events, you know, in multiple places. And, and people always say, why didn't we do it in Maddenburg or Langa or in Robertson? We just happen to be here. So we welcome you here and we ask that you come here. Um, and we will do everything in our power to get you here. Um, in, uh, we have a, a, a Mario Wanda, otherwise known as Gato, had made an appeal that if people have any money to, to give him, to help to get community members to come to, to cover the cost of the transport. Uh, Mario, you all met him earlier. He's uh, Gatto, you know him. If you've got anything, he's got a hat there, he said, and he's going to pass the hat around. So please help if you can, people. I mean, I think it's quite serious. The thing is, we need you to buy the book. We need you to buy the book. The book normally goes for 250 Rand, and tonight, Alan has allowed a major discount, so you can get the book for 185 Rand. Okay, so um, I wish we had kept the 250 and made the, dif the difference go into the uh, student bursary fund, but uh, it's been said, you're going to benefit on the, on the lower price. Um, Alan will also be signing uh, copies of the book. You'll be seated over there. Uh, our photographer will also be at hand to take pictures of you with Alan. And the book, there's still more soup left, there's still more coffee left, there's more tea left. Hang out with us for a while, um, and you're welcome. Thank you, everybody.